Welcome back. This is session three of the significance of metaphor in the Bible, figurative versus literal language. My name is Frank Spear. I am a native New Jerseyan, a former pastor of 15 years, a Bible student for over 25 years. Picking up where we left off in our last session, we were studying Isaiah chapter 13, and we need to realize that this took place in 539 B.C. Okay, this is history that we're studying here. This is in the past. This is over. This is done a long, long time ago. This is not some future end of the world. And he makes that plain by saying, by starting out saying, this is an oracle concerning Babylon. Let's flip over a few chapters in Isaiah to Isaiah chapter 19. Now here we have something very similar. This time though, we're talking about God punishing Egypt, the nation, the kingdom of Egypt. Look at verse one, the oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. So here we have a coming of God on a cloud. Sound familiar? Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Jesus uses this identical language. So did God literally come to earth when he came to destroy Egypt in the Old Testament? When he brought one nation against Egypt to destroy Egypt? Did he literally ride a cloud down to planet Earth? Of course not. We're back to this metaphoric language that the Hebrew prophets used to announce, to prophesy a coming day of judgment from God upon a wicked nation or people. Now, I want to drive this point home so that you'll never, ever, ever forget it. You'll never question it. So the question becomes, why when the Old Testament prophets used this type of language, can we agree that it was metaphorical, yet when Jesus uses it, many people demand that it must have a literal fulfillment. In other words, the sun, moon, and the stars have to really go dark. He has to really come to earth riding on a literal cloud and set up a literal earthly kingdom. Yet when we ask those who hold to a futurist eschatology what these Old Testament passages mean, they say, well, clearly that's metaphor. But it also has a dual fulfillment, talking about when Jesus returns at the end of the world, so to speak. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that dual fulfillment and all of that in a little while. Let's continue reading here in Isaiah 19. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence. Idols can't tremble. Idols are made of wood and stone, gold. <laughs> so again, we have this language. And the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. And now watch this. So I, God, will incite Egyptians against Egyptians. God says, I'm going to create civil war. Yet that will be me coming on a cloud with judgment. It, it's the same thing over and over again throughout the Old Testament. God incites one people against another people and calls that his coming, his vengeance, his judgment. And indeed it was. Now there are those who, who may venture to argue, well, Frank, how do you know in the unseen realm, while these armies were attacking other armies in the natural realm, in the, in the physical realm of planet Earth, that some corresponding actions were not going on in the supernatural realm, in the invisible realm, behind the scenes, that God wasn't coming on a cloud, so to speak, and wasn't in the invisible realm uh, manifesting himself in some way. Frankly, I have no problem with that. To me, it doesn't matter either way. Okay, if while those batters, battles were going on on planet Earth, if God was literally doing something in the heavens to incite or facilitate that battle, that's fine with me. It would have to be, wouldn't it? <laughs> I have no problem with that. Theologically, exegetically, I think you can make a good case for that. And if someone else says, well, I don't think those things were actually happening in the heavens. This is just pure metaphoric language for God saying when one army is fighting another, it's like I'm pulling out the sword from my sheath, God is saying. It's like I'm riding down on a horse and a chariot. It's like I'm drawing blood in these battles because I've caused this battle. I have no problem with that either. 
either way is fine with me. Okay. And you'll have to decide for yourself. So, but here we see a cloud coming in the old Testament. Well, there are multiple cloud comings in the old Testament. Exodus chapter 14, we read that the Lord was looking down upon the Egyptians from a cloud and he threw them into a tizzy and they became so frightened that they ran all the way home. So this cloud motif appears over and over and over again uh, throughout the Old and New Testaments. I mean, Jesus was taken up in, in a cloud. Now, do we think that that was something that was seen by all, or was that something that took place in the invisible realm? I venture to say it was in the invisible realm. The Mount of Olives was a pretty popular place, a pretty big spot. A lot of people would have been there. And yet we're told that the tw only the 12 saw this happen. Okay, or at least that's inferred from the text. An angel has appeared. This is something I think is taking place in a vision or something akin to what took place with Elijah in the Old Testament when he was whisked away to heaven in a chariot of fire. Not something to be seen with the natural eyeball. Let's turn to, let's stay in Isaiah and turn to chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Now again, uh, this chapter is talking to Judah. God is talking to Judah and he's warning them about forming an alliance with, the, with Egypt, okay, to protect themselves against their enemies. And God is telling them, don't do that. I'm your help. Come to me for help, okay? That's the context of the chapter. Let's look at verses 25 and 26. Now, notice the language that the prophet uses here. This is God basically, let me set the stage a little bit more here. God is saying, if you will trust in me, repent of your sin, I will deliver you and bring you back into your land and it will be better than ever than into the land of milk and honey. And it will be a tremendous time of blessing and I will bless your socks off, so to speak, if you will just forget Egypt and turn to me, I am your help. That's the context here. And God says, this is what it's going to be like when you come, when I bring you back into your land and you're worshiping me and we're all doing things the way they're supposed to be done under the covenant that we've made with one another. He says in verse 25, at that time on every lofty mountain and on every high hill, there will be streams running with water on the day of the great slaughter. When the towers fall, the light of the moon will be like the light of the sun. And the light of the sun will grow seven times brighter, like the light of seven days. Now, do you think that God was literally meaning there that the sun would get seven times hotter for Israel if they obeyed God? Of course not. I mean, it was hot enough out there. They lived in the desert. And do you think that God is literally saying here that the moon would become as bright as the sun? then where would the night time be? And we know that if the sun became seven times hotter, uh, if it became one times hotter, the, the entire planet Earth would melt, it would disintegrate, let alone seven times hotter. <laughs> so he's saying, I'm going to heat the sun up seven times hotter. Well, not literally. This is harvest metaphor. This is the metaphor of blessing. Remember, these people were sustained by... Uh, fruits and vegetables. Their very existence depended to a large degree upon their crops, their produce. They were farmers. And so God is saying, I'm going to make the sun shine hotter for you. I'm going to make rivers pour out of every mountain. I'm going to make the moon brighter so that even at night, your, your, your crops are, are, uh, are receiving nutrients. You see what he's saying? He's using hyperbole exaggerated language for emphasis to make a point to say, if you obey me, I will bless you more than I've ever blessed you. He's not literally saying, I'm going to, I'm going to make rivers pour out of every mountain. Look, flip, stay in Isaiah 30 and let's look at verses 30 and 33. He says, and the Lord will cause his voice of authority to be heard and the descending of his arm to be seen in his fierce anger and in the flame of a consuming fire, in cloudburst, downpour, hailstones. For at the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be terrified when he strikes with his rod and every blow of the rod of punishment which the Lord will lay on him. On who? 
on the nation of Assyria. God personifies Syria by calling the nation him. And I'm going to beat him with a rod. Well, did God literally beat Assyria with a rod? Well, no, no more than Assyria was a man. Okay, and here, look at the language, right? Flames of fire, consuming fire, clouds, downpours of hailstones. This sounds an awful lot like the book of Revelation. All of this language is used. And yet, we know plainly from the context of Isaiah 30, God is talking about punishing Assyria for what they did to his people. Yet he uses this cataclysmic, end-of-the-world, apocalyptic language. Turn over one chapter to Isaiah chapter 31. And look at how verse 1 starts. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and who rely on their horses and their chariots. Okay, so the same theme is running forward, running forth here in Isaiah 31. Now let's jump down to verse 4. For thus says the Lord to me, as the lion or the young lion growls over his prey, against which a band of shepherds is called out, and he will not be terrified at their voice nor disturbed at their noise, so will the Lord of hosts come down to wage war on Mount Zion on its hill. Watch this. Let's continue on. Verse 5. Like flying birds, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will pass over and rescue it. Boy, this sounds like the language of the Exodus. It also sounds like the language of Revelation. It also sounds like the language that Jesus used when he was talking about coming down out of heaven on a cloud to wage war. Okay, let me clarify. I believe that what Jesus was talking about in his cloud coming is exactly what I what God was talking about Jehovah in the Old Testament when he was threatening cloud comings. And when he came on a cloud, he came in judgment against the kingdom, against the nation, against the people, a rebellious people. And how did he do so? By bringing one army against another army, by bringing one nation against another nation. When Jesus prophesied that he would come on a cloud, what happened in 70 AD? In that generation, Rome came and destroyed Jerusalem. Why is that so difficult for people to grasp and understand? Why is it so difficult for them to swallow? Well, because we've been taught, so many of us growing up in church, that Jesus was using literal end-of-the-world language, and they feel disappointed, let down somehow, that Jesus was talking about the termination of one covenant and one covenant people, and the institution of another covenant and another covenant people. My question is, how in the world can you be let down by that? If you're a Christian, you're part of that new covenant people. You're part of that new covenant and you live under it. Jesus was in essence saying, when I come to destroy in the Roman armies, when I come to destroy old covenant Israel and do away with that system, I'm going to inaugurate, institute my kingdom. And in my kingdom, salvation will be available to all nations and all nations will be worshiping me and praising me. Now, he didn't mean every person in every nation. That's the mistake that people make. See, they read that prophetic language and they think, well, that Jesus is talking about his literal earthly utopian kingdom. When he comes down out of heaven on a cloud and he reigns in Jerusalem, seated on a literal throne of David, reigning over all the nations of the world. And then all nations will come singing to Zion and everlasting joy will be upon their heads so forth and so on, all these Old Testament prophecies. What we need to understand is that they were speaking about the spiritual kingdom of Jesus and people becoming Christians all over the world and entering into this kingdom. Look, Jesus, could he, say, could he have said it any plainer? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Some supposing that the kingdom was about to come, the scripture says, asked Jesus about it. And he said, when my kingdom comes, no one will, it's, it won't be observable. It won't have signs that are observable with the human eye. People won't be able to say, look, there it is, or here it is, right? It's not something you can smell or touch 
right? Or taste or see. This is not a five senses kingdom. My kingdom is not of this realm, he said. If it were, he said, my servants would pick up swords and fight. So the fulfillment of Jesus sitting on the throne of King David as the eternal king was fulfilled when he sat down at the right hand of the Father upon his ascension into heaven. Acts chapter 2 makes that plain. Let's look at one more passage in Isaiah. Turn to chapter 34. Now, here we have a particular city called Basra, which was in the land of Edom, E-D-O-M. And the theme here is God's destruction of the capital city of Edom, Basra, by ancient Babylon. We're talking again in the 500s BC. All right, now let's begin at verse one. Draw near, O nations, hear and listen, O peoples. Let the earth and all that it contains hear and the world and all that springs from it. For the Lord's indignation is against all the nations and his wrath against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them and has given them over to slaughter. So their slain will be thrown out and their corpses will give off their stench and the mountains will be drenched in their blood. Okay, this sounds like God is talking to the whole world. Well, obviously he's not because this is concerning Edom. Babylon would come and destroy them. Now, some will make the argument, oh, no, this is talking about the future city of Basra, and it will be restored, and a restored Babylon, and these these wars are to take place in the future. Well, the Bible says nothing about that. As a matter of fact, historically, this was fulfilled, and we have the historical evidence and records of that. So why look for something in the future that's already happened in the past? We have no biblical warrant to do so. But, but nevertheless, there are those who are going to argue, we know that was fulfilled, but it's going to be fulfilled again. No, the only reason you're saying that is because you need that to be true in order to sustain a particular eschatological framework. And so you've got to say that. You've got to say that this prophecy has a dual fulfillment or an ultimate fulfillment to come in the future when the Bible never says that. The Bible never makes that claim. So let's read on here. It's talking about God's indignation to all the world. Well, I think he's talking to Israel there, especially because we have biblical proof that God considered Israel to be the heavens and the earth. If you look at Isaiah 51, verse 16, it says this, I have put my words in your mouth. Well, Israel had the law. And I have covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish the heavens and to found the earth and to say to Zion, you are my people. Here plainly, God says he established the heavens and the earth when he established his covenant with Israel. Doesn't this make a whole lot of sense out of Jesus's words? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Here in Isaiah, we see plainly that when the old covenant was established with national ethnic Israel, the heavens and the earth were established, so to speak. And Jesus said that that old heavens and earth, the old covenant, would pass away. But his word would never pass away, i.e. the new covenant. So getting back to Isaiah here, he says, speaking to Jerusalem, to Israel, Hey, wake up, world! See? Pay attention. Now, we know that God is not talking to the Chinese people here, right? He's not talking to the Northern American Indian, okay? Back here uh, uh, 500 years before Jesus was born. He's talking to those local Middle Eastern nations, and he calls them the world. And he says, pay attention, all the people of the earth, the land, the ground, the Middle East. See, I mean, think about it. How could Isaiah the prophet hundreds of years before Christ was born without radio, without television, without telephone, without internet be uh, saying, hey, pay attention, entire world, entire globe, all the people of planet Earth. I mean, that would be awful unfair to the people in China and Japan and the people of North America and South America because they could never hear the message. So they wouldn't be able to be warned. And what would they be being warned of? Judgment upon Basra in Edom? 
in the Middle East? What in the world did that have to do with them in China or Antarctica? You see the point here? So he goes on. He's talking about the fact that a people, a local people are about to be destroyed. Verse four, and all the hosts of heaven will wear away. Wow. And the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. Wow. And their hosts will also wear away like a leaf that withers on the vine or as one withers from the fig tree, because my sword is satiated in heaven. God has a sword in heaven. He says it's satiated. Behold, it, that is my sword, shall descend for judgment upon Edom. Well, there you go. This is not global language. This is not God coming down in wrath on the whole world, on planet earth on all of his material creation and all humanity. He says, but it sounds like it's that, right? Look at verse four again. All the hosts of heaven are going to wear away. The sky is going to be rolled up like a scroll. He's, God's going to pull out his sword. It's going to be satiated in fat and in blood. Then he says, behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom. Oh, okay. And he goes on. And upon the people whom I have devoted to destruction. Well, who's that? Well, hold on. He's going to tell us. My sword is satiated with fat and with the blood of lambs and goats and with the fat of the kidneys of rams. God is saying, I'm going to destroy all your livestock with my sword. I'm going to destroy your economic system. I'm going to bring your kingdom down. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. Revelation 14 verse 10 talks about a lake of fire burning and people being cast into it and the smoke of it going up forever. Now here we have Isaiah chapter 34, Isaiah prophesying against Edom, a particular kingdom and nation and their particular capital city. Well, the New Testament is prophesying about a particular people, Israel, and a particular capital city, Jerusalem. Now look what he goes on to say. Verse 7, God speaking, wild oxen will fall, young bulls will fall with strong ones, and their land, that is Edom, will be soaked with blood, and their dust will become greasy with the fat of these animals. For the Lord has a day of vengeance for Edom, a year of payback for the cause of Zion. What is God saying? I'm paying you back, Edom. It's payday for what you've done to my people, Israel, Zion, Jerusalem. I'm coming at you in 3D with everything I've got. And I'm bringing an army against you to destroy you. Okay, now watch this. Verse 8, for the, for the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. It streams, its streams, whose streams? Edom's. Edom's streams will be turned into pitch and its loose earth into brimstone, and its land will become burning pitch, and it will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will go up forever from generation to generation. It will be desolate. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a second here, God. I got questions. Okay, first of all, this sounds, this sounds almost identical. No, it sounds identical to what, you're, what you say in the New Testament, what Jesus said about the lake of fire. This sounds identical to what the book of Revelation is talking about for those who take the mark of the beast, their destination. Yet here in Edom, you're describing a lake of fire where the smoke goes up forever out of this lake of fire. And yet plainly you're describing your judgment upon a local town. You're describing your judgment upon a local Middle Eastern people. Well, so is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is an expanded prophecy of what Jesus prophesied in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. Now, look what he says. Verse 10, it will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will go up forever. From generation to generation, it will be desolate. None will pass through it forever and ever. Well, people are passing through it today. That land is still there. People are passing through it. And I guarantee you, if you take a flight over there, you will not see smoke that's going up. Yet God says here, the smoke from that land will go up forever and ever. He's saying, I'm going to burn your city. And the smoke of that will go up forever and ever. 
Well, no, it didn't. Not literally. But wait a minute. In Revelation chapter 14, those who take the mark of the beast are apostate Israel. And John says that they will be thrown into the lake of fire and the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. Well, could it be saying the same thing that the Old Testament prophet, the Old Testament Hebrew prophet was referring to here? Could God be saying the same thing to the New Testament Hebrew prophet John when he was predicting the destruction of Jerusalem and the people living inside? My money says yes. My money says it's exactly the same thing. That verse in Revelation chapter 14 is not talking about hell, place of eternal conscious torment upon anyone who is not a Christian. This is not what this is teaching at all. It is teaching the same thing that Isaiah chapter 34 was teaching and that God was going to destroy Jerusalem, burn it with fire, and that people were going to be thrown into that fire and destroyed. And that is exactly what happened in Edom, in Basra, and that's exactly what happened in Jerusalem when they were thrown into the Valley of Gehenna, which is what Jesus told the people during his three and a half year ministry. If you say to your brother, you fool, you are in danger of the fires of Gehenna, the burning garbage dump outside the city of Jerusalem. When the Romans come and burn that city to the ground, your body will be found there. Because if you're found as a part of apostate Israel, you're my enemy, God says, and I will burn you. Jesus told a parable. Let's look at it really quick. Jesus tells a parable. Before we get there, let me just finish up something really quick here in Isaiah 34. Look at verse 11. He just got done saying that the smoke will go up forever from the city of Basra. And by the way, doesn't the Bible say that the smoke from Sodom and Gomorrah goes up forever? Jude tells us that. Was it really going up forever? No. I think what they're saying here is that people will remember always that I destroyed you. And that this is what happens to rebellious people. And the aftermath of that of that fire is smoke. And people will remember what happens to people who rebel against me. Are we talking about it today? We sure are. Are we remembering it? We sure are. Are we remembering Basra today? Ancient Basra that was burned? Yes, we are. We're remembering their suffering and their torment in that fire when God brought another nation against them to destroy it because they rebelled against God and they messed with God's people. Same thing we see in the New Testament. Folks, this is what the New Testament's all about. Now, he says in verse 11, but the pelican and the hedgehog will possess the land and the owl and the raven will dwell on it. Okay, then it goes on to say, that the nobles will no longer live there, right? But he says that thorns and thistles will live there and the jackals will haunt that land. Well, how is that possible? How can these animals live there, the owl and the jackal and so forth, the pelican, if it's a burning lake of fire and its smoke is going up forever? What are these fireproof animals? And is it still burning forever and ever? No, he says from generation to generation. That's how he describes forever and ever. Well, did the fire literally burn from generation to generation? No. Are you beginning to see the significance of metaphoric language? Cataclysmic, apocalyptic language? What is God simply saying here? He's simply saying, I'm going to wipe you out and people will talk about it forever. And we are. We are still talking about it some 2,600 years later. Now, let's flip over to the New Testament. And see how Jesus uses very similar language, even in his parables. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Let's go to chapter 22 and listen to the parable of the marriage feast. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Jesus spoke again to them in parables. Who? To the Jews, to the Jewish people. That's who his ministry was to. It was to the Jews. And here we have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the priests, the religious Jewish leaders of the day, as well as the disciples and Jewish people. And listen to this. Now we know from verse 45 of the previous chapter, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood he was speaking about them. Well, there you have it again. Okay. 
<laughs> Go back and read that parable in Matthew chapter 21. Jesus is talking about his coming. And the Pharisees say, when Jesus is talking about those who are going to be punished at his coming, it says that the Pharisees understood he was talking about them, those first century religious leaders, Jewish leaders who lived in Jerusalem. Okay? <laughs> there it is, folks. It doesn't get much plainer. He's not talking about, Jesus was not talking about coming and destroying planet earth and the globe and pouring out his wrath upon the whole world. The Pharisees understood what Jesus meant. Now, look at this. He continues the theme and the same people are listening, the Jews. And he says this, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Okay. God is the father. God is the king. Okay. The father is the king and Jesus is the son here in the parable. And he sent out his slaves, his followers, his apostles, his prophets to call those who had been invited. Who was invited? The Jews. Okay, they were the first invite to be invited. Remember, the gospel is to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. But they were unwilling to come. Now, is this true? Yes. The Jews did not want anything to do with Jesus by and large. So God's covenant people, Israel... The Jewish people did not want the message when Jesus came to offer the message of the new covenant, his kingdom, the marriage. They were invited to the wedding feast, didn't want to come. Here we go, verse 4. And again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatted livestock and all are butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. In other words, come get saved. Put your faith in Messiah. The new covenant is here. Jeremiah 31, 31 has arrived. All of that ancient prophecy in the Old Testament is being fulfilled in Christ. Come to the feast, eat and partake, right? Jesus said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, partake of me, right? Now watch this, verse five. But they, the Jews, paid no attention and went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. Watch, here comes verse 7. But the king, God the Father, was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. You catch that? Wow. Look at all the connections here. You connecting the dots? Okay, God the Father was angry at the way they treated his son and the offer to come to the feast. So he sent his armies. This is exactly what he did all throughout the Old Testament. He's doing it again. He sent his armies in the parable. What armies? The Roman armies this time. He sent the Roman armies and they destroyed those murderers. Who? The apostate Israel, rebellious Israel. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, listen carefully here. You are of your father, the devil, who was a murderer from the beginning and your murderers too. He calls them murderers and he says to them, fill up the measure of the guilt of your fathers who murdered the prophets, you brood of vipers. How then can you escape the sentence of hell? Hell, the eternal place of conscious torment? No, the word here is Gehenna. How are you going to escape this fire that I just got done speaking about in this, in this parable I told? You're going to burn in the city of Jerusalem when the Romans burn it to the ground. How are you going to escape this when you're going around murdering my followers, just like your fathers did, murdering the prophets, and you're going to murder me too, just like in the parable? Another parable I told, told where the vineyard workers murdered the son of the owner. You see, folks, how it's all connected? This is all first century judgment. This is all a first century day of the Lord upon the wicked people of Israel who rebelled against their God. We see cities being set on fire, just like we did in the Old Testament. There are no literal cosmic disturbances, no termination of time and space. Material creation did not come to an end. And it will not come to an end. Not as far as the Bible tells us. What we see in the New Testament is identical to what we saw in the Old. A destruction of a rebellious people, a rebellious kingdom. We see uh, the catastrophic end over and again of a kingdom on earth in a specific geographical location. God using one nation as his instrument, his sword or his bow or his chariot, right? To destroy another nation. 
And when that nation comes to bring swift judgment upon the enemy nation, God says, that's me coming to you. See, the time statements were literal. I'm coming soon. I'm coming a long time away. He makes those plain. As long as we're reading, we'll see those things. But the graphic, vivid, cosmological language was not literal. And I think the connection from the Old Testament Hebrew prophetic language to the New Testament Hebrew prophetic language is quite obvious once we come to understand this by comparing Scripture with Scripture by comparing the metaphoric use of language by the Old Testament Hebrew prophets with the metaphoric Hebrew language of the New Testament Hebrew prophets. Jesus was a Hebrew prophet. His apostles were Hebrew prophets. Yet I missed it for 30 years. So what does that say? It said I didn't do my homework. It said I wasn't a very good Bible student. None of this language was ever meant to be taken with a wooden strict literalism. It couldn't have been because the sun, if it became seven times hotter, would have burned the earth to the ground. If the sky was rolled up like a scroll, the earth would have been destroyed. If the stars went dark and the sun went dark for even one day, the earth would be ruined. And yet the Old Testament tells us that those things quote unquote happened when local cities were destroyed. We'll pick up more on this next time. This concludes session number three. Please refer to your student session instructions on this webpage or see your student handbook for complete details. Music